Goblins are cowardly, cunning, and relatively weak, and they live in a dangerous world. They respond by lashing out at any creature they believe is weaker than them, or that they believe that they can bully. They're tricky in fights, and cruel in their victories, but also servile in defeat. They occupy the extremes, and even in their own society, the lower caste members of the tribe must grovel at the feet of those in a greater status. In summary, goblins are the ultimate bullies. Now, these creatures aren't dumb. They don't have a negative modifier for their intelligence stat, which implies that it's either a 10 or an 11, meaning these creatures have around the same intelligence levels as the average human, or even slightly above average. Goblins know they are a weak and relatively unsophisticated race that can be easily dominated by bigger, smarter, more organized, more ferocious, and more magical creatures. Their deities have been conquered, and when Maglu demands it, even their souls aren't theirs to own. They know these things, and it is this knowledge that compels them to dominate, enslave, and be cruel to any other creature that they can, whenever they can. Goblins seek to trap and enslave any creatures that they encounter, but they'll flee from any foe that seems too strong. You can expect the surrounding area of a goblin lair to be filled with pit traps, snares, and nets to catch the unexpected. When their hunting parties encounter other creatures, they will almost always opt to capture their foe instead of killing it. Goblins that find themselves on the outskirts of society will first test their defenses. Maybe a couple things start to go missing around the village, and if this behavior goes unpunished for too long, then they'll up the ante, and maybe people will start to go missing. Enslaved creatures receive the worst treatment that the goblins can dish out, while still getting a decent performance out of their slaves. No point in having a slave if you kill it, right? But other humanoids and monsters that are exceptionally capable can find themselves treated like favored but still abused pets. Being a slaver is actually a massive part of the goblin culture. Their one remaining god after Maglu's ascendancy is wholly dedicated to enslavement and being the masters of others. Ker Gorbeeg, also known as the Overseer of All, drives his worshippers to be the masters of others. With the motto of only by wielding the whip can one hope to escape its lash. Can one truly begin to appreciate how important slavery is a part of the goblin culture? You won't be surprised to hear that the Overseer of All's symbol is a yellow and red striped leather whip. You also won't be surprised when you learn that the Overseer makes his wishes known through wrathful signs and magical blessings, such as the cracking of a whip with no visible source, chains, ropes, and other types of bindings that move on their own accord, and even sometimes the appearance of a glowing cage that traps foes who displease the god. Since the symbol of the overseer is that of the whip, it is used in goblin society as a mark of authority. This mark of authority is used on lower caste goblins, slaves, and enemies alike. Having knowledge of how to make a whip is enough to elevate a goblin to the highest caste in goblin society, and this knowledge is typically kept secret. This secret is often kept by one family of goblins in a tribe, so that they can monopolize all the prestige as well as the supply of whips. If you're a creature that can be beaten into servitude, then there's a chance that you can be found with a goblin tribe, but rats and wolves are almost always present. These animals have been with goblins for as long as dogs and horses have been with humans, and the animals serve similar purposes in goblin society. Goblin tribes are typically organized into a four-tiered caste system made up of lashers, hunters, gatherers, and pariahs. The status of every goblin and family in the tribe is based on its importance to the tribe's survival. Families and goblins that belong to the higher caste keep their status by not sharing their knowledge and skills with others, and those in lower castes have little to no hope of escaping their tier in the caste system. If you don't understand the goblin social system, then you might find yourself confused by how goblins interact with you. A human warrior may scare off a dozen goblin gatherers, but then find themselves attacked by two goblin hunters. Lashers Lashers are the closest thing to nobility that a goblin tribe has. These are families of goblins that have been trained in the ways of battle, 
strategy, possess skills in trap building, beast taming, mining, smelting, forging, whip making, or religion. That leather armor and shield that gives your basic goblin an AC of 15? Those respective smiths can find themselves squarely in the lasher tier of the caste system. That goblin shaman that just fireballed your party into an immediate death save? Lasher tier. The lashers follow the tribe boss and enforce their will on others with whips, hence the name Lasher. Hunters. Hunters are the families of goblins that are skilled with weapons, but don't have any other special knowledge. They have the second highest status in goblin society. That goblin that your party saw riding into the fight on a wolf? Probably a member of the hunter tier. These goblins tend to be the best wolf riders in the tribe, and know the most about the territory that's the furthest away from the tribe's lair. They're in charge of hunting for the tribe's food, and during fights with your PCs are used as scouts, foot soldiers, and goblin cavalry. Gatherers Gatherers are the second lowest caste in goblin society, and they're responsible for getting food from the surrounding area, taking what grows in the area naturally, or stealing whatever they can. They're also the ones who handle the very basic forms of farming that goblins are capable of. Gatherers are tasked with checking all of the traps for captured people or beasts near the tribe's lair. They aren't typically armed with anything more deadly than a knife or sling, but they are often equipped with nets, caltrops, lassos, and nooses on poles. This tier of the goblin caste is also in charge of cooking for the tribe, and during wartime, making poison. Gatherers and pariahs fear the most for their lives during battle because they believe that hunters and lashers possess hidden and special knowledge of how to survive. So the members of the lower castes in a goblin tribe are the ones that give goblins their reputation for being cowards. Pariahs Pariahs are the goblin families that are the lowest of the low in a goblin tribe if it doesn't have any slaves. If a tribe does happen to have slaves, then the pariahs can enjoy the opportunity to supervise creatures that have no status at all in goblin society. The pariah tier is typically composed of the most dim-witted and weakest goblins. They get the worst jobs in the tribe like cleaning out the animal pens, cleaning up after other goblins, and generally doing all the hard labor. Now that you know the caste system and the tiers that make it up, let's talk some more about goblin culture. Goblins love status symbols. Since that is the case, it only makes sense that the tribe's boss also loves status symbols, and is often found having them on or around their person. These symbols can be typical things like crowns, but they can also be other things that may not make sense to you, but make perfect sense to that particular goblin tribe. Colorful boots, a cloak made of scraps of elven tapestry, a special breed of rat, or an intricately designed wolf saddle. All of these can be status symbols in goblin society, and a goblin tribe may have more than one of these symbols. So how are these bosses determined? Well, goblins model their government after their whip-cracking god, the Overseer. So this means that goblin tribes are autocratic in nature. The passing of a goblin leader will often result in a chaotic transition of power, as is the case with any tyrannical form of government. Sometimes the old boss has the foresight to declare a successor, but we've all seen Game of Thrones. Declaring a successor doesn't always stop the mad grab for power by other goblins in the Lasher tier. Sometimes a different creature entirely can assume control of a goblin tribe by killing or subjugating the previous goblin boss. If the creature that took over is dumb, like a troll or an ogre, then whichever Lasher goblin can bend the creature's ear will act as the real boss. If the creature can't be manipulated, then the goblins will simply back off and fall in a line. At the end of the day, the boss is whoever wins. So your players can find themselves in the role of being a goblin tribe's boss, if they play their cards right. If you're an up and coming adventurer, or simply an adventurer worth their salt, you'd be wise to give special attention to any goblins you hear chanting, bleep, bleep, bleep. This means magic in the goblin tongue and might give you and your party a life-saving hint. There may be a powerful sorcerer lurking among the goblin tribe. Spellcasters of any kind are rare among the goblins because they simply lack the intelligence and patience to learn and practice wizardry. Sorcerers seem to be less prevalent 
and the Overseer seems to dislike sharing his divine power with his only followers. Although many goblins would be quick to offer anything to have the powers of a warlock, the potential patrons know that a goblin is very unlikely to be able to uphold their end of any bargain or deal that they make. On the off chance that a goblin is born with the ability to become a spellcaster, the knowledge and talent necessary to carry it on hardly ever lasts more than a couple of generations. Since goblins have little to no experience with magic, they don't make any attempt to differentiate the types of magic that exist. It's simply all buyag, and that word is part of the title of any of its practitioners. Buyag casters are goblins that served under a hobgoblin wizard and managed to sneak a peek at its master's spellbook. It somehow managed to learn a bit of wizardry by mimicking the gestures and words that it remembered. These goblins can cast a randomly determined first level wizard spell once per day with intelligence being its spellcasting ability. Buyag wielders are goblins that found a magic item and figured out how to use it. Buyag whips are goblins that for some reason the overseer felt nice enough to gift it with the power to dominate others. Specifically, it can dominate 1d3 goblins and enslave them. Buyag slaves are goblin warlocks that serve a patron who can extract payment in flesh if the goblin doesn't do as promised. Typically, this is a coven of hags. Buyag, Buyag, Buyag is the goblin equivalent of a wild magic sorcerer. An interesting type of goblin that pops up from time to time are the Nilbog. Nilbogs are goblins that have been possessed by the spirit of a nameless prankster god. They tend to appear in locations where goblins are particularly mistreated, so even though goblins are at the bottom of the hierarchy in a goblinoid host, the threat of a Nilbog appearing is enough to deter the hobgoblins and bugbears from inflicting too much cruelty upon the lesser goblin counterparts. Even though the threat of a Nilbog appearing is a serious one, Hobgoblins have learned how to deal with the situation by simply placating the Nilbog and having a jester position in all of their goblinoid armies. So, good adventurer, you now have a little more knowledge of the goblins. You now know how they govern themselves, how they treat others, the differences in the goblin casts, their hunting and gathering habits, and you even know where the goblins stand in the pecking order when it comes to the goblinoid races. I think it's time now for you to learn about where they live. Goblin Lairs First things first, if done right, getting to a goblin lair undetected should basically be a nightmare for starting adventurers and still be difficult even when you have a party of adventurers in that 6 to 10 level range. A goblin lair can be anywhere. It can be in a mist covered valley, a dark forest, a cave, or cave system, or even the sewer system beneath a city. Goblins are capable miners and crafters, so they'll try to settle down in places where they have access to raw materials to make weapons or armor. Since the goblins have a strong need for metals, this will sometimes put them in conflict with other races. Most of the time though, goblins will get what they need by settling down in abandoned mines and clawing away at veins that were believed to be completely dry. If and when a goblin tribe does decide to expand upon a mine, the tunnels they dig are small and warren-like, effectively turning the mine into a labyrinth where a goblin could conceivably pop up out of nowhere. Goblins will live in and around the tunnels. They guard the area around their lairs for miles, frequently sending out patrols of hunters equipped with warhorns and wolves. The territory around a goblin lair, also known as the outskirts of that territory, tend to have some not-so-noticeable hallmarks for a fledgling adventurer but dead giveaways for those who know what to look for. Packs of wolves in an area may be a sign that a goblin lair is in the area. Hunters also like to take the high ground when it comes to guard duty. Maybe it's a high rocky outcrop or high branches of a large tree. Anything that can give them a good view of the surrounding area is a place where a goblin guard may be standing their watch. Obvious pathways in an area may also become dangerous ambush points think roads, clear game trails, or even rivers. All of these are strategic points that a goblin tribe may keep an eye on. This area can be expected to be filled with net traps, snare traps, pitfalls, 
and this is the area that will be often checked by the gatherer cast of goblins. This area will also include the burial grounds for each tier in the cast, not near the lair, but not too far away from it that they would stray into unknown territory. Let's say you somehow manage to navigate the outskirts of a goblin lair's territory without being spotted. What might you find the closer you get to the lair? Well, you can expect that the lair exterior will definitely have obvious signs of habitation. Here you can expect to see goblins at work with other goblins standing watch over them whether it be to protect them from intruders like you or ensure that the pariahs do a job well done. If the lair was built around a mine, then you can expect to see a forge or furnace somewhere in the vicinity. If the lair is established in a forest, you can expect to see something akin to a basic timber mill and piles of cut wood. If it's in a mountainous area, you can expect to see a quarry or mine. The point is that a goblin lair will always fit in with the setting that it has been established in. They adapt, and if the lair itself doesn't have sufficient space to house all of the little monsters, then the pariahs and the other lower cast goblins will be housed outside of the lair in little huts near where they work. For the sake of example, let's give this theoretical goblin tribe their ideal place to establish a lair. Ideally, the lair interior for a goblin tribe is an abandoned mine with two to three large chambers and roughly a handful of smaller chambers, and a majority of these chambers will be connected by little goblin tunnels weaving in and out of them. With a lair like this, the tribe can protect its valuables while also allowing for some small creature comforts. Most lairs will have one main entrance, but you can expect countless escape tunnels. Near the main entrance, you can expect to see a wolf's den, and unless the goblins need them for a certain job, the wolves are free to come and go from the lair interior as they please. Any tunnel inside the lair? It's safe to assume that it's trapped in a way to harm you and collapse that tunnel. Open spaces are useful so you can expect the goblins to hollow out chambers and use them as need be, like for keeping slaves and other tamed beasts in. The tribe boss will lay claim to one of the large chambers and effectively turn it into a throne room. The other large chambers can be expected to be occupied by the lashers and hunters. So to sum it up, in a goblin's ideal situation, you can expect their lair to be a mine that has at least three main chambers with other smaller chambers. Near the entrance, probably in one of the smaller chambers, you will find the wolves trained by the goblins living there. In the other smaller chambers, you can expect to find slave storage or tamed beast storage. Maybe they're separated, maybe not. The main chamber closest to the entrance will probably be where the hunters live, and then the next main chamber will house the lashers. And finally, the innermost main chamber will contain the throne room where the tribe boss lives. Examples Now that we've learned that goblin culture has some complexity to it, what do we do with that information? Well, we can start adding some razzle-dazzle to our goblin encounters. I feel like this is most players' experience in dealing with goblins. Tell me if this seems a little familiar. Alright. Roll for a random encounter. Or, you see a job listing on the quest board asking for help with a pack of goblins taking a village's livestock. The dice get rolled, attacks are made, and damage is done. That's it. But it could be much more. Instead of finding a small camp of four goblins in the woods, maybe the fact that goblins have gotten bold enough to begin stealing livestock directly from a village it's neighboring has dangerous implications. This could mean that a goblin's territory and strength has expanded to the point that they no longer fear any repercussions from stealing livestock from settlements. Instead of a few goblins, you're actually dealing with possibly dozens. And instead of an easy stroll through the woods, your party's rogue is now suddenly the most important person in the world because they're the only one that can find the countless traps littering the outskirts of goblin territory. I hope this helps stir up some ideas when it comes to how you implement goblins in your games because they have the potential to be absolutely deadly if the DM plays them in a way more reflective of their actual stat blocks. I'm guilty of doing the quick throwaway goblin encounter as well, so this is advice to myself. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode on goblins. Like, comment, rate, 
and share this podcast with any of your D&D interested friends. Hope to see you next week where we'll talk about bugbears.